Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. If you find value in what we do and you'd like to support the podcast, go to coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com forward slash alone, or you can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com forward slash support us to find out more. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I'm here today with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is money talks, free versus paying markets. Before we get into this, uh, by the way, this was a question from a listener, so we are going to go ahead and, and you know answer another one of those. But before we do, we're going to talk about what we did this week, Holly. Oh boy! Um, this week I w- I am doing. I started on Monday doing the write-in revision of Dead Man's Party, and that was after taking all of last week to build my my monastery line for scene outline. And I already knew going in that the first twelve chapters were going to be pretty much total rewrites. Um, and I figured, you know, my, <laughs> okay, I need to go back here for just a second to math because math and I are not and have never been friends. And when I was writing, uh, commercially, uh, I was averaging about hundred thousand words per novel. So when I was saying, well, you know, in revision, I generally add about 10% to uh, the novel when I'm writing it, that was a really easy figure because you figure, well, the novel was written, it came out to, it was about 100,000 words, I added 10%, that was 10,000 words. When I was talking, when, when I was thinking about and doing the math for this and thinking, well, this is going to run longer, um, and I was thinking 10%, I was thinking, oh, an additional 10,000 words. No, if it's a 50,000 word novel, 10% is 5,000 words. So, I was doing the math and uh, I posted on my journal, or on my blog rather, that I was definitely going to run longer than 10%. Well, it's going to be a lot longer than a lot longer than 10% because I was thinking it was, I'd come in at 10,000 words. No, the novel was 50,000 words. I'm going to be lucky to finish it at 80, which is 60% longer. (laughs) Because, yeah, math. (laughs) so this week uh i wrote the first five chapters and now how many words are in a chapter for you um well with these it was about 1200 words and the chapters this week have been running about well a lot more um yeah because i know a couple of them were over 2000 uh yeah all of them were over 2000 Um, well there was one that was like super short on friday oh yeah well friday friday that was the reason for that um yeah yeah, monday was 2414 words tuesday was 3038 words wednesday was 2115 uh thursday was 2040 and Friday was 254. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yes. That's the one I was thinking of. That was because I I was fighting with myself over whether to put in a villain point of view or not. And I had it in the first draft. Mm-hmm. And I tend to really dislike long, wordy villain points of view because it gives away too much of the story. It gives away the vi- villain's motivation. You want that to be something that the reader has to find out through the villain's actions, not through the villain's thoughts. Um, and again, that's a generalization. Right, right. But I, yeah. I tend to not like <laughs> this reading is for them you. either. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's any time a writer has written a villain point of view, there is always too much mustache twirling and hand. Uh, well, not always. For the ones for, that I have for, read, for, I have for, never yeah. found one that I've liked. Not ever. Yeah. For the ones that you're talking yeah. about. Um, so for me... That for me, that is a specific. For other people, that is a generalization because other people read books different than the books I read. Mm -hmm. So you can find villain points of view. I'm sure somebody has that are done well. I've just never read one I've liked. Yeah. So, but I decided I did need to have a small point for him. So he's going to get maybe 250. I've got four scenes planned out for him 
for the entire novel. And I figure I can keep each one to maybe 250 words. And uh, that will also give me a couple of short writing days. <laughs> oh, so my total for the week was 9,861 all new words, all new chapters, all brand new stuff because I screwed up the beginning of the book. In first yeah, draft. that's very cool, though. I mean, that's a lot of a lot of words and a lot of work. It flew. It came together because I had done the line for focus or the the line yeah. for scene focus line outline. For scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it from was from the monastery. And for anybody who doesn't know, that's part of how to revise your novel because yeah. she's going through and revising now. Yeah. So that was my week. That was my whole week. <laughs> that was everything I did. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, and just what you were talking about with the villain, I was like, ah, yeah, I know I definitely did that in Leaving Wanda Lucia. And it's just one of those things that I want to put back in because I think if you read Glass House, um, that's one of the things that I wanted to change. I don't really generally put in villain points of view either, mm -hmm. but I've read some really good ones, like where they they really make you kind of they don't give away too much but they do make you kind of sympathetic for okay the villains. are they antagonists or are they villains no villains okay pure All pure right. absolute villains yeah um but again that's and i think there is that delicate balance of giving away too much mm -hmm. um because yeah the majority of people seem to write the villain scenes as like an obligatory thing mm -hmm. and you do just like within leaving wanda lucia they do come across as a little too villainy um and not enough um i i don't know I, not enough is their own character mm -hmm. i think a lot of times um, yeah, my week was a lot different. I'm sorry. <laughs> Just the lesson sevens. Seven, I, I mean, I, I don't remember, because I don't have my notes with me, and that's my fault. Um, I don't remember if I finished lesson six this week or last week, but I know lesson six is, is done. I've, I finished seven, lesson seven A. I'm still on lesson seven B. So describe and, what lesson seven is. <laughs> Just... Yeah, well, so far it. Um, well, yeah, okay, so lesson seven is where you're going through the sets, where you're going through um, each of the scenes, and you're going through the stages, the sets, like the world, and you're basically giving personality to each of the the scenes, and or the sets, and I don't know if I talked about this last week or not. I'm not sure. I, I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I know, I probably... Did, yes. Okay, so I was working on Lesson 7 last week because I was trying to think, and I know I went on about how amazing How to Revise Your Novel was because two scenes, um, just just by doing two of them, I had already found, like, one was underused and one I found, like, a twist in. Well, I finished that part of the lesson, and that's 7A. So, <laughs> and there's four, four parts of <laughs> Lesson 7. So I finished 7A the seven A's and, and the majority of the scenes or the settings that I was doing, I learned something new. I found better ways to show, um, character through really super simple, tiny details that change and make the rooms a part of the story. It's really, really important. Um, like, and I can think of a couple of different books where I feel like I'm inside that world. I feel like I can see everything, but rereading, the author doesn't use like a whole bunch of words to describe the place. You don't have to go on and on for a page and a half telling people about what everything looks like or, or their religion or their past or their history or anything like that. It's just a couple of little tiny words mixed in with the actions of the character that really, really just put you in that world mm -hmm. and going through this lesson the lesson a and finding out like what was so special about each individual setting changed a lot of how it's going to be represented 
Um, I cool. also found out that knowing your characters and then also doing this this thing where you're changing and you're trying to define each set individually, you find out more about your characters. Because I know a little bit about Tracy's past. Again, this was this was for as much shit as we give pantsers, <laughs> uh, especially in our episode plotting versus pantsing. Um, and Leah was like, "Wow, you guys really tore pantsers apart." So I just have to apologize about that. <laughs> well, you gotta understand, I have pantsed, and I have gotten my ass kicked every time I've done it. <laughs> yeah, it said that that now how to write a novel is a lot of it, the majority of it is pantsing. So yeah, but it's controlled pantsing with a parachute, so it's sort of different. <laughs> yeah, sort of. I mean, it just it definitely makes um, us eat some of our words about how we <laughs> we're we're shitting on poor pantsers. But yeah, um, going back to this, it's. Because you know so little about these characters, because you don't overwork them, it leaves your muse with a whole bunch of room to play. And I know a little bit about her, and I'm as I'm doing her house, I realize, like, some of the scenes that were set in one room, it didn't fit because of her past, her history, It would they would have all been set in the bedroom. Because the bedroom is the private room, you know, it's like, that's where she can be, you know, not what her character needs or think she needs to be. So anyway, that's it's confusing, but the way I'm, I'm wording it. But then I also got into lesson B, and the B is um, I tend to overwork, so I had to take yesterday off because I generally don't take any days off. Even on the days where I take, you know, quote, off, I'll still do a couple hours of work. Mm -hmm. So I'm finding I'm... I'm burning out. So I had to take yesterday off. But the seven Bs, I'm, I'm about halfway through the book. And that's where you're finding the blinkies, <laughs> wallpaper. <laughs> shin bangers. Um, shin bangers. Yeah, yeah. and one more. Yeah, yeah. What was the last Mind one? is a blink. Doors. Doors. Doors, yes. So yeah, you're going through all of that. And I'm finding once again, like, I, I am very light on description. <laughs> I felt bad printing out all of those worksheets because <laughs> I'm not usually, I'm not really filling them in. <laughs> so, yeah, I just but anyway, that was my week. My week was full of revision and slow revision at that. Yeah. But I I am getting there. I'm doing the um the full version because I still haven't learned necessarily like after the first two you start to implement stuff, or even after the first time you go through, you start to change your own writing with subconsciously. You don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And then the second time through, I actually went all the way through. I've noticed, again, there are some things that I really, really was able to, um, to, to fix. Even though I still had one character who is pretty important, but I went on for a page describing what she looked like <laughs> and it's like what the hell that is such a noob like w w where did this come from yes yeah yes just everyone down to like while. her little pink cardigan and pearl buttons and it's like <laughs> no what the hell are you doing uh, yeah i think sometimes your muse just needs to get an idea of what somebody looks like yeah and get an idea of their personality so it does shit like that yeah oh yeah well there's i i still find noob shit in in revisions of novels that i am writing now every once in a while you just you have this sort of regressive barf that yeah. just goes onto the page and it's um but every... well, it's like I told you, I found an as you know Bob. Yes, yes. Well, I was I was revising out the as you know Bobs from the first draft, uh, and no, and 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 this week I was writing. I had some that I was writing, and I caught myself while I was writing them, and managed to pull them out as they were going in. It was like no, 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 cut it back. Yeah. So if you guys find yourself doing stuff like that, it's perfectly normal that's yeah. what revision is for <laughs> it is but every every novel that you revise makes the next novel you write better because you learn more of the mistakes you ingrain more of you don't you don't learn how to write a novel from writing the novel you learn how to write a novel from revising the novel 
Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's where you find all of the stupid shit you do and then you fix it. And then the next time you don't do some of it and you'll forget some of it and do it again. And then the revision after that, you'll get rid of some of those. But it's yeah. a lifelong process. And some shit just comes back no matter what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Today's topic is money talks. And we are talking free versus paying markets. And this was a question. So I'm going to go ahead and read the question. It's a little bit of a long one. And then we can get into your answer. Yeah. So the question is, been mulling over this since completing Holly's how to write short stories class. Thanks to the class, I've got three stories currently submitted to some online magazines. Finding a place to even submit to was the first problem, uh, in parentheses, until I found a website called the Submission Grinder, uh, in parentheses. Narrowing down where to send them has been tricky in a way I didn't anticipate. I've seen sites that pay six cents to 10 cents a word, sites that pay five cents or less, sites that pay a flat rate of 25 for a short story, no matter the length, and then sites that do not pay at all. Obviously those six to 10 cent ones are mighty appealing, whereas the no pay ones seem pointless unless you wanna say, hey, look, I'm published in future cover letters. As an unpublished author, I've struggled a bit with where I should submit based on the pay. I might be better fit for some of the markets that don't pay as much, but $25 for a 7,500 word short story seems like selling myself a bit cheaply. Part of me feels like talking about pay is a taboo subject, but I figure I can't be the only one wondering this. What would Holly's take on where an author should focus her time in the submission process in regards to what sites pay? Is there a good ballpark pay a new writer should have as a benchmark especially when first submitting can can we before we get to your notes can we talk about that that taboo yeah let's talk about that taboo because that's um <laughs> because this is a job damn it yeah it's hard work yeah, it, it's hard to learn I, I don't <laughs> see you taking job interviews with somebody and like oh well I don't want to discuss how much I'll get paid you know what I mean like <laughs> no. you, you, you go to a place and you're, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a call center worker, whether you're an accountant, anything, I don't see you say, oh, oh, we don't have to talk about the money. Right. No, God, <laughs> no, please. You know, that's, that's embarrassing. Uh, no, it's not. This is, this is a job and it is a very tough job to get and it's a very tough job to keep and it's a very tough job to make a living at. And the first thing you have to consider is can you get paid for what you write? And you have yeah. to be, first off, you have to get good enough to be paid. Uh, and that is part of what we are going to be discussing here today. But once you are good enough to get paid, then you have to figure out how to get paid often enough to not freaking starve. Well, um, <laughs> I also just wanted to say, this is a big thing in the artist community as well, is, is that there is a certain amount of... Um, like, okay, so there's two things. There's people who don't create telling you you're lucky to get paid at all. So, <laughs> like, oh, my God, $25 for a 50,000-word novel? Wow, you just got paid. That's great. I mean, it's just a hobby anyway, or you're just making shit up anyway. Like, you should be grateful to have gotten paid anything. Um, That's a douchebag. <laughs> and then... Yes. Uh, no, that is that is somebody who 100% has no idea because anybody that's ever said that to me, it's the same thing like, oh, well, why don't you work for minimum wage? You're, you're lucky to even have a job in this in this uh, economy. Why don't you work for minimum wage and save the people who are who are paying you more money, mm -hmm. you know, save them more money? Because that's basically what it is, is it, it's a, it's with publishers, they are the, the less they pay you. In a lot of instances, it's the more money that they're getting. Right. So that's, that's why a lot of people have gone to indie publishing. But the second thing is there's this overall kind of thing, this attitude with a bunch of people. And unfortunately, it's very prevalent in, in the creative circles. Yeah. Is that you, you, you don't do it for the money, yeah. which is fine. You know what? Part of it is you're not doing it for the money. But part of it is you are doing it for the money. Right. Right, there is there is this this denigration of people who are yeah. writing with with the 
objective of getting paid for their work that if you do this you are a hack or a sellout or a sellout yes yeah no you're somebody who wants to be able to do what you love for a living and in order to do that you fucking have to get paid yeah now holly and i were talking about this just personally and here's the thing when and and this is what i'm going through now because i i'm not contributing as much to the household as i would like to and what we were talking about basically came down to i am doing the work that is paying me it is paying me emotionally i am paying to do this work by sacrificing other things by us you know we don't have as many nice things as we want or there are certain sacrifices that you have to make to do this so it's paying me and i'm paying it to let it continue paying me in the hopes that it will actually physically pay me with money so that i can continue to pay Mm -hmm. to, to do it so that it continues to pay me right. it's it's such a weird way to look at it but you, this this isn't t- money when it comes to the things you create it shouldn't be a taboo and i hate hate when people say things like um uh what what uh, yeah exposure exposure like Mm -hmm. when it comes to now there are there are some genuine reasons why you might want to do something like that so it's not a a, a complete that's that's what what we're gonna gonna get get into into. yeah Yeah. but um but for the most part you have to look at the at the money thing as you have created something of value you have created something that is going to mean something to somebody else and some people create furniture Mm-hmm. Some people create houses. You, you wouldn't see an architect be like, oh, well, just give me the house for free. You know, like an architect and, and their cu- their yeah. customer. Just give me the house for free. It'll be great exposure for you. Yes. I'll tell everybody. I'll tell all of my friends. I'll tell everybody who made the house. Yeah. You'll get a lot of business this way. <laughs> an architecture would shit bricks if he heard that. <laughs> yes. Yes, and and as a writer, you need to laugh your ass off in the face of the person who says this. You need to practice this laugh in the mirror so that you can laugh evilly when someone says, oh, yes, do this for me for free, and, you know, I'll give you the exposure for it. And you go, ha, 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 ha. That's, that's funny. I actually, there's um, there was this thing that Leah said because we, we talk, and I talked to her over um, – uh, Instagram and she was talking about something about a flasher and she meant like a I uh, god what was it oh yeah she said her sister-in-law got flashed and I thought she meant like the flashers that walk around that and, was... and open yes but apparently in Aussie slang flashed is when you're speeding and the auto and the the cameras on the red light or oh. they so she went she either was speeding or so, she went through a red light no and naked she got, man in oh, a raincoat flashed yes oh okay yeah so she got flashed which means that she's getting a <laughs> ticket for something and i was laughing so hard and then we talked about like what we would do and that was my response if every if anybody ever freaking flashes me i'm gonna sit there and cover my mouth and <laughs> laugh my ass off and point at it and be like oh my god it's so small or whatever you know because that's that's not the reaction they're looking for. No, 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 it's definitely not. <laughs> so, that, that's an aside. So let's get back into to writing. Um, yeah, so paying, paying versus, yeah. uh, free versus paying markets. Okay, so, so briefly, I, I just want to throw this in also um, because there are people think that you have to jump into this from nothing to full-time money on your first go-round. That, that you have to, the, the job has to go from nothing to I can make a living at this in like one book. Okay, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, the, so, the percentage of that, I mean, you're, the, oh, you're not necessarily going to be E.L. James or right. um, J.K. Rowling. Right, and you can't assume that you will be. You have to assume that this is an ongoing process. So the way that I did this, and I think the way that you did it too, is you break up your life into bills that have to be paid. And yeah. you look at, okay, well, this is a bill that has to be paid, and this is a bill that has to be paid. And this, you take them from smallest to largest, 
and you you start looking for a way to have your writing pay the smallest bill every month. And when your writing is paying the smallest bill every month, then you go to the next smallest bill. And you say, okay, now I have to add another something that will allow me to get that bill paid every month from my writing. And you work your way up until all of your bills are being paid. And then you look at your savings account, okay, and then it's this amount of money pays the bills, and I need to have this amount in savings. And once you have all of your bills paid, and between six months and a year that you could live on if you have to in savings, then you get to quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's the way that it should have worked for you, but unfortunately, life situations kept shitting on you, and it, it you never had the chance to do it quite like that. Not quite <laughs> like that. No, I did the yeah. insane thing and quit the day job on my first three novel um, contract. contract. Yeah, the yeah. my first big three book deal. My, my my first three book deal, not even big, just first yeah. three book deal, uh, because I needed to be home with my kids. We've discussed that in other episodes. Uh, yeah. And when I had that, I didn't even I didn't even blink. I quit nursing. I put my nursing license on mothballs, and I walked out of the job. I, I mean, you know, I yeah. gave them notice, but yeah, yeah. But that was it. I was done, and I never went back. And just to anybody listening to, um, you can't find anything that I have I've written under my name. I had a pen name for a while that was doing very well, and that was starting to pay a couple of different bills. Like the writing was paying for itself, its own website, its its the things that I had, and then one other bill. And then Barnes and Noble changed their TOS, the terms of service, and then just deleted everybody that wasn't following the brand new terms of service because they're trying to fix the site and turn it into Amazon, basically, which good luck. Mm -hmm. But it's just a whole bunch of us got our entire incomes just wiped out by by that. So yeah, my stuff isn't even, I, I might make a couple of bucks a month now on what I've my other pen name, which I do not divulge. And I'm, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but the, the thing is like Holly's been saying, when it comes to your also reds, that's something else that we, we might need to do. Once we figure out the marketing, yeah. we'll, we'll definitely be doing an episode on marketing. Yeah. So, but yeah, so let's get into Okay. The topic. Yeah. So with the money, with the understanding of what you're looking for to make the money, now let's go ahead and talk about the places where you can make the money. And obviously the first place that we are going to look at is pro paying markets. And I have another aside here and it's really important. Anytime you are looking at online, anytime you are looking at offline print publications, anything where you can sell your work, look carefully, carefully, carefully at the rights claimed by the publisher. You need to know how long it will be before those rights revert to you, how long it will be before you can republish the story. Um, if you can republish the story, make sure you do not sell all rights ever to anybody yeah. ever, never, never, ever, ever sign a contract that, that sells all rights. Even if it's just a short story. No, because you can start by, by building short stories and by building up a library of short fiction that you then republish with nice cover art, maybe put it into some of your own anthologies, sell them as little singles for 99 cents, if you know, like six to 10,000 words, something like that. You can start building a small income that can build you a readership over time. So damn it, watch your rights write, read those things. If you're not sure what they mean, go to somebody who knows what they mean. And by that, I do not mean your buddy who thinks that he knows law. I mean, yeah. somebody who actually knows how to read contracts. Um, and you might have to pay for this service. Yeah, but if it ends up saving you in the long run, I mean, and, and just to understand your contract, yeah, that's worth it. And also to know that if you leave this publisher or whatever, or if they cancel the series, you can never write in this world again. That's something that you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, you do. And 
you know, you want to make sure that you own the work that you create and that the people to whom you sell rights to use it are just buying rights to use it, that those rights are f strictly limited, and that you own the characters, you own the world, you own the concepts. So, okay, now, so with that little downer, let's get into looking at pro-paying markets. Pro, the pros of going with the guys who pay the most are, you know. Well, give some examples of pro-paying markets. Um, I honestly don't know in the magazine world anymore, but, you know, for, for large stuff, um, Scholastic, uh, Bain, um, HarperCollins. Penguin. Yeah, Penguin. Um, Tor. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, anybody that has a New York publishing office and uh, it offers can sell you world rights or, you know, whoever the pro markets are in your place. And this is novels. This is short fiction. This is... Um, you know, magazines are are always coming and going, and mm -hmm. they have much flakier, tend to have much flakier contracts. You need to watch them carefully um, so that your story just does not disappear down the black hole of, well, I can't get the rights back on that, and the magazine's dead. Yeah. Uh, and it's funny that you say that because uh, the four things that I've ever submitted to magazines, all of the magazines were literally closing as I was submitting them mm -hmm. and I had no idea. And they just sent me the notice, sorry, but we, we loved your story, but we're, we're, we're no longer a magazine. Right. <laughs> like, yes. son of a bitch, all four times. Yeah, yeah, so you killed four. I only killed two that I know of. One was Dan Pettipus's uh, uh, Cosmic Landscapes, and I'm trying to remember the other one and I can't think of it now. But, I was submitting to erotic magazines. So. You would think those would hold up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but anyway, if you're looking at places that pay and that pay well, the obvious first benefit is the money. You know, obviously, yes, you are doing this for the money. You need the money to pay your bills. The second thing is for the pro credit which is this thing makes me a pro or at least gets me one sale, if it's a magazine sale, um, to any writing organization that requires that you be a professional and be able to prove it. This gets me that pro credit. Um, they have, they can bring you a broader readership um, because they have a marketing department or they have online advertising, or they have, if, if it's an online magazine, they have guys who subscribe. And every month, those guys get whatever it is they put out that month. So you know people are going to at least have your story in front of them. And this is really important. Uh, you, oh, okay. And then there is this little benefit that is the biggest benefit you can possibly get, and that is the bio line. And that bio line needs to have your name and your website link, or your Twitter account, or your yeah, Pinterest account, or people to find yes, you. something that people can subscribe to so that they hear from you. Your mailing list. I am a big, big fan of mailing lists. I am terrible at getting emails out to them, but they are the backbone of an online writing business. And he's cute, isn't he? Yeah. 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 yeah cat is, is being adorable in front of me right now. Um, okay. So that's the pro to this. Now, the biggest con of this is that because they are pro-paying markets, they are very, very hard to hit because everybody from the best writer to the absolute worst writer is going to them first because everybody wants to get that money. And they, they give little or no feedback unless you are spot on, unless you are good enough to be writing for those markets. Your chances of getting anything but just a form rejection are almost non-existent. Um, they have a massive submission pile, so it takes forever to hear back. How, by the way, is your novel feedback coming? One year and three days there today. You, there you go. 
Uh, and massive, that's the Harlequin. Yeah. Massive submission pile to a commercial publisher. Um, you know, the days of hearing back in a month, I, I mean, and I heard back in a month on a book that they bought right out. Um, the, the, the days of sending things out and never hearing back at all, the, I, I experienced that a lot of times or just got a form rejection a lot yeah. of times. That's what I was just telling Leah is like, this is this right now, this whole a year and three day wait, that's, that's not abnormal. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I think that it is not great is because Harlequin makes their money on turnover. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, you think they'd be a little bit more quick to make decisions on books and get them out because that's, I mean, they have to have rapid pace publishing right. to make their money. But, um, for bigger places like Penguin, like Bain, like, you know, the, these bigger publishers, I know of several people who have just never heard back. Right. Like, and that's what I was telling Leah is I'm like, it's not that rare that this is taking that long. No. And that's what a lot of people don't understand, too, is like a lot of my non-writer friends are like, oh, it must yeah, just the reaction of I can't believe you have to wait that long that's so not normal <laughs> how would you know you're not a writer you haven't right. looked into this this is pretty <laughs> average it's just whatever their site says double their it. submission yeah, yeah I was gonna say at least double it and even then Harlequins would be six months and yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah you know seriously I really think you know if it weren't just that this is an experiment for you at this point to see how freaking long it takes them to get back to you yeah um I would just suggest pulling it and moving on to another market but you know I I know that you're doing this for a specific reason and part of yes. it is so we can kind of you know uh wink and laugh when we talk on the podcast <laughs> yeah i mean at this point it, it originally it was just because my husband i made the promise to him that i would submit you know and that this is and i told him i'm like okay well after harlequin i can just self-pub he's like no this 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 novel right here is the one that you wrote for me this is the one you're going to submit to everybody until you have all the rejection letters and then you can self-publish it <laughs> and i'm like oh okay oh geez i'm gonna be <laughs> At this rate, I'm probably going to be like 52 and <laughs> like, all right, I, I've submitted to everybody. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, you think basically you need to have about three to five markets, commercial publishing markets that you want to send it to. And beyond that, you just go, well, you know, that is sufficient. That yeah, is, I have. I'm, I'm not submitting it to every single option out no, there. No, no. You know, beyond that, you have done your your little um, uh, Monty Python self flagellation while walking down the street, <laughs> sort of thing. And you know, you're good. You've been there. You've done yes. that. Yes. Um, okay. So then, let's look at that's that was our pro paying markets. Obviously, those are those are the ones that everybody wants. Now, let's now look at semi pro and small paying markets. And these are um little indie or, or little little small commercial publishers that maybe do you know, six to ten books a year they're a specialty market um but they are they are commercial or they're the magazines that that uh have a regular online presence they do offer uh some money but it's small money it's this is the ones where she was talking about what the under six cents per word uh, yeah, yeah, it was like five cents. Yeah, she or was a twenty-five dollar flat to... fee for any story yeah. of any length, things like that. They're actually, you know, they are they are paying money. They're just not paying a lot of money. And yeah. um, okay, again, the pros of this: the first one is the money because you still get paid. Mm -hmm. You still get to say, "Hey, I got paid." I might not have gotten paid enough that, for example, Sifwa will let me count this as a credit. I think their cutoff limit is something like five cents a word. And if it's lower than that, then that doesn't count as a SIFWA story. Oh man, I would, I totally would have made it. Yeah. Except that it's, that it's well, it's but romance. you weren't writing science fiction, so yeah. No, exactly. Except <laughs> that it was romance. But I had a poem that I sold for three dollars when I was twenty-three. It was my first, uh, or twenty-two. It was my first ever sale. I got three dollars for the poem. Yeah, there you and go. And then I didn't cash the check. I just saved the check. Oh. Dumbass. I just I took a photocopy of mine and then cashed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was my twenty-five dollar check from, um, um, uh, the, God, the yes, from Aboriginal, and oh please, 
Charles Ryan. There we go. Had to pull that out because I, I owe that man so much. <laughs> never, never met him. Have never heard from him again. But I owe that man so much. He <laughs> he gave me the courage to go on at a point where it was really, really tough to go on. That was when we yeah. were living at the little place in Blues Farm. Yeah. 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 And that, I mean, just to have that kind of moment, especially when you needed it most, that's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. That, that confirmation right there. Yes, you can do this. Yes. <laughs> after, after all of those revections, including the much, 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 too much uh, exposition. Ones. Exposition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So then the money, obviously, but then there is something that these smaller markets have that big commercial publishers don't. They have a targeted readership. They are doing a specific kind of book or a specific kind of magazine with a specific kind of story, and the people who read that are fanatical for that kind of fiction. And if you write that kind of fiction, you can build a genuine fan base more quickly than with a bigger publisher. You can find your readers out of going through that smaller, tightly knit community that has built up around that publication. And uh, the, the upside of that is more important than the money. Yes. That's finding your readers and finding them all in one place. Oh, my God, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's worth more than getting paid 6 to 10 cents uh, if you're if you're getting $25 for a 7500 word short story, but you find but a bunch of readers find you mm -hmm. and love your story. Yeah. Then I mean <laughs> I have a I have a little specific story about that. There were my, those two po poems that I had published in Aboriginal. Um there, there was a, an online service. It was like the first online service, and I was on it. It was called Genie, uh, and it was the GE Network, Inter Internet something something. It was an acronym, but it was Genie. And SIFWA had a topic, or a, I don't even remember what they were called at the time. They had specific names. They aren't what we call them anymore. Um, but... And I had, because I was a, a, a you know, science fiction member by that point of SIFWA, I had my own little fan group board. And two of the people who were the first ones on there and who had bought Fire in the Mist had found me because of reading those two poems in yeah. Aboriginal. And they said so. They said, oh, my God, you know, we, we loved, and they knew each other. And they had apparently, you know, kind of passed the poems back and forth or something. And they both had liked them. And they found me on this board because, not because of Fire in the Mist, which was my first novel, but because of two Shakespeare takeoffs that did these, these two sonnets that I wrote <laughs> for a science fiction magazine. Okay, that is the thing that these smaller markets can bring you that nothing else can. And that's, because they're more targeted. Because yeah. the people who show up to the smaller markets have, have looked for those smaller markets, have found those smaller markets, have liked what they've done, yeah. and devoted themselves to them. And that sort of weird, smart-ass, tongue-in-cheek humor that is a staple of most of my work, even the really dark, scary stuff still has these moments of smart-ass and funny was what brought them to me because that was the first thing they saw about me was these two wry, kind of semi-dirty poems. And they, they, that's, and they went, that, we want to read more of that. And <laughs> then they got that in the first book. So, you know, that, and that's, everything I've done has had some of that in it. Yeah, so you never know where people are going to find no, you. No, you don't, and you never know what their first impression of you is going to be. So at the point where you start publishing your work, you need to be very careful about what you put out there. Um, you need to make sure that it is re representative of what you love, or if you are learning that it is not under your name or the name you want to publish all your other stuff under. Because... Um, 
you have a learning period. Lawrence Block wrote under under a, a pen name when he was writing his porn and learning how to tell fiction. Yeah. yeah I, you know, people did this, and people still do this. And the name that you want to write under, you need to save to be um, the name that 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 comes at the end when you know you're good enough that you want people to find this work and know you wrote it. Yeah, basically what I've been trying to do with the pen name yeah. is the same thing, just getting all the kinks out, learning the system, and now that I have the ability to write Fulton Hills, I'm doing that under my name. Yeah, so. yeah. and having read that book, uh, or having read the, the first one. That, that is no, you book. haven't read any. I haven't read, read any of the uh, Fulton Leaving Hills. Leaving Wanda but... Lucia, which it was going to go under Rebecca Murray. Oh, that's right, I, yeah. Yeah, which is still it's my which name, is still but it's commercially a pen name. publishable. It's a very good book. <laughs> yeah, now, hey, I don't say that about everything, and I don't say it because you wrote it. Because I, as you know, Bob. Um, yes. <laughs> when you yes. read things that that did not quite hit, I told you. <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then after that, after the targeted readership, the, again we're going to mention the bio line. This thing that allows you to connect in from the story or the book, you know, in your little bio at the back where you say, this is my website, or this is the sign up page for my mailing list, or this is my Twitter, Facebook whatever page. your social yeah, media. Whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever thing you use the most. But you have, where you think, yes, yeah. you have to have this because without yeah. this, your readers cannot find you. And I can't, I cannot emphasize how important this is because readers who know your name, even after they buy your books, are going to be the vast minority of the people who read you. Yeah. You are going to be an accidental buy for the vast majority of your sales. Don't think somebody's just going to automatically Google your name and try no. and try to find you. You have to make it as easy as possible, especially if it's a first time reader. Oh, just God. say and and hopefully. If whatever you put up as far as the way to to for them to follow you or contact you is a way that they are familiar with and they like like oh my god she's got an Instagram I could that's so awesome and then they'll go follow you mm -hmm. you know yeah so yeah this is um this is big and the other thing is that you really hope that none of these things that you're using go obsolete yeah uh, because, because they all will eventually yeah they will eventually but you want to have you a way to keep in touch with your people if they do and that is your website and your mailing list and you want to self-host your website you want to have it on a you don't want to have it on somebody else's platform no we'll matter. throw out a little bit of a shout out here to tiger tech That's oh yeah tiger as in the animal and t-e-c-h dot net. net yeah yeah dot yeah. net uh, Holly's been using them for years and years and years, and mm -hmm. I've been using them since I was 20-something and got my first, uh, the Gnome production company when I had a production company <laughs> yes. for a while. Tiger Tech is the best. They're awesome. Their customer service is amazing, and they're not, you know, they're not um, sketchy at all. No. Nothing. No, they have I been, mean, they're, they're, yeah, they have, they got my system up and running when a a really shady, really shaky company with a big name tried to steal my uh my domain name hollylyle.com and they helped me get it out of there they helped me move it they got they got the domain name for they they helped me walked me through the process of taking the domain name from these people who had tried to steal it and getting it on to them and it has been there for roughly 20 years now yeah. um and i uh you know, it's one of the other places is one of the biggest places on the internet, and they already have a long line of haters. So I am not even going to mention them by name. That is that is uh, TigerTech.net. Uh, if you want, you know, to check them out, check them out because they're great. They're yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I have an affiliate link for them, but I'm not even going to recommend it here. I am just going to say they are worth they they are worth your site. They really are. They yeah. are they are the best site I have ever ever worked with. Um, yeah, and she's I love she's them. definitely been through a few, and I've been through yeah. a few as well. Yeah, and I figure I've I've been with them pretty close to twenty years now. I think. Yeah, so, probably. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so okay. yeah, own own your own site. Yes. And, yeah, uh, own your own site and have your own mailing list, uh, because if all else fails, 
you still need to be able to get in touch with your people and say, hey, guess what? You know, <laughs> this big service that we all loved has just changed it, turned to service and kicked me off of it. And, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, <laughs> if you still love my books, hi, I'm over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So then after that, after the bio line, semi pro markets offer possible editor feedback. Now, again, these are places that are actually paying money. They're not paying as much money, but they are paying money. So they too are getting inundated. They are buried in submissions. They are just absolutely swamped. So you have to be pretty close to what they're doing before you're going to get any personal feedback. And you have to understand this going in. If you do not submit a story that actually fits their requirements, you are not going to hear back or you are not going to hear back in a timely fashion, or you are just going to get a general checkbox rejection, and you might not get it in a timely fashion because, yeah. like I said, buried. I talked to one editor from a small publication, and she said, we are currently getting about a 1,000 submissions a week. Small publication, not paying scale, not paying, not paying professional rates. Thousand submissions a week, tiny, tiny staff, people who are doing this as much for love as they are for money. Understand that there are a lot of writers out there. And understand also that most of them just suck. Mm. <laughs> most of everything that goes in is utterly unpublishable because the majority of writers are not listening to podcasts like this. They think they know everything and they yeah, are. They're pu- not. Yeah, they're not reading books on how to write. They're not going to sites and learning. They're not watching YouTube videos from writers. They're not taking classes. Yeah. None of that. Right. Somebody somewhere along the way told them that they had talent. And they decided they didn't need to know anything beyond that. And so, and, and when I say 99%, it's actually according to... Every editor I have ever talked to about 99.99999... Infinity. And run that out. Yeah percent is utterly unpublishable so if you are writing something good and it's targeted to their market your chances of hearing back with something are actually pretty decent if you can stand it long enough for them to even find you (laughs) on the other side of that as well though is that even the slightest thing can land you a rejection. Right, because if they are getting that many submissions, enough of them every month are going to be good enough, pretty much as is, to go in Mm -hmm. without requiring a lot of fixing. So if you're close, if you are close, you're probably still going to get a standard rejection. You have to be spot on. Yeah, and your first page could could have a little bit too much exposition. Your first Mm -hmm. page could have you know, a character that doesn't fit and you were hiding the fact that they do fit. It could have the wrong setting. It could just, it could be a day where the person was just off. Yeah, it could just be, it could just be a a, a thing where the editor doesn't like that kind of first, of opening page. Yes. And, and is so swamped that he or she cannot read further. Yeah. Because. And you're, you're gone into the slush pile after that. Yeah. Okay, so. The, the possible editor feedback, understand that your odds of getting any feedback whatsoever are astronomically against, and that it's not personal. It is a case of massive overwhelm. Um, okay, then, now let's look at the cons, and the cons here. The first one is these markets are still hard to hit because they are paying real money. Um, and they may not offer feedback, which we kind of covered that. And... Uh, it is a big, big submission pile. I think you've already covered yeah. all the cons, to be honest. Yeah. Hello, my name is Vanessa Wells, and I'm an indie writer and editor. I've been a student of Holly Law for over a decade. I thought that I was buying a revision course when I purchased How to Revise Your Novel. <laughs> what I got was a course on applied critical thinking for writers. Holly's courses invite you to write wonderful stories and break down if they work, how they work, why they work, and why they don't. They give you the tools you need to succeed. Okay, so now let's go to the pays in copies category. Okay, 
Um, the pros of pays in copies are that you get the copies. Uh, you have proof of publication. If it's an online magazine, you have the link, you have um, some place that you can send people to see your work. Uh, and if it's magazines, well, you know, those went out and they send you some copies of it and uh, you can you can show them around and then you can republish the story noting previously published in x which is always very cool and it gives yeah, and you there's the coolness factor of you got paid in actual copies of those yes too. yes like, there there was so remuneration neat. and yeah. that matters and um when i was getting started i submitted to a lot of paid in copies magazines and killed a couple of them uh because <laughs> Because that was where I got some of my first acceptances. Unfortunately, the magazines then died. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's uh, that happens. But you also, if you get published in these, and if the magazine survives long enough, uh, then you are again hitting a targeted readership who likes that kind of story. So if you are writing to that our audience's target demographic, um, then you have people who will see what you've written. It will be like what they like, and they will find you. And people who read small print publications tend to be both very specific and very interested in new writers who write the kinds of things that, that they love. Yeah, so, you're more likely to have somebody look you up. Yeah. Look you up online and find find you just just by the name alone because the more targeted the market, the more interested those people are going to be if they find something that fits what they like. Yeah. They're going to want more. That's how I found Darcy Coates. Yes, if you if you are publishing in small publications with a small readership, these guys are active. They're sending in letters to the editor. They're saying, hey, you know, we like this author. Get more by, by this person or, you know, if you can. Or, um, you know, I would like to see more of this. Or there is this feedback that, that small publications can do that big publications can't. And the feedback is a lot faster nowadays with email mm -hmm. and with websites and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so small pays in copies publication is still a big deal for you because it can help you find your people, the people who will really love what you do. Um, the bio line, again, this is a big deal. Now, at the point where we get to pays and copies, it's a little easier to hit these markets because there's no money involved, so there is a small amount less competition. Now, again, there are a lot of writers and there are a whole lot of writers who do not pay any damned attention at all to the magazine submission guidelines or the book publisher submission guidelines. No, no attention. They just don't care. They're going to send to everybody because somebody's going to buy what they write. And they don't understand that the people who are running these publications know what their readers like. And anything that isn't that is just going to get a straight out rejection. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah. with, with a nice little quiet F you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because you if you just broadcast, submit your stuff to every place, then everybody is going to hate you yeah. because you, may, you are making their lives miserable because they have to read at least a portion of what you sent that doesn't fit. Realize, and if you continuously do this, they're going to start they, to remember yeah, your name. Yeah, they will remember your name. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> that's not a good thing. The no. one thing that I wanted to say about pays and copies that, that I didn't see on your show notes is if you continuously do this and you do it for magazines where um, where they are, it's kind of like you're building it up. So let's say there's two or three magazines that you continuously get your pays and copies for. Not only are you getting that credibility of, you know, you're continuously there and, and your name is repeatedly, you know, repeatedly published, it's going to lead to better paying. It's going to lead to actual physical money pay. Right, right. Because you are getting experience in working with an mm -hmm. editor. You are getting experience in, in taking notes 
on what you did wrong and fixing them from the editor's perspective. And this is um, like on-the-job training where you are an intern, where you are working for nothing just to learn how to do the job. And it's not nothing because you get, again, the readers. You get yeah. the copies. You get um, the credibility. The credibility. Get, yeah. Yeah. They, and you, the other thing, too, is if you've submitted a couple of stories and published and then your your next story doesn't quite hit the mark, if they know you and, and they know that your stories spark with readers, they might work with you on that piece that just didn't hit the mark. Whereas if you hadn't submitted to them before and you hadn't published with them before, they probably would just give you a form rejection. Right. Right. You're building relationships. Yeah, and and relationships matter. You, you want the most relationship, the most important essential relationships you build are first off with your readers, where yeah. you are, you become... Your people. A, yeah, your people, where you become a trusted source of the kind of fiction they like, and in order for you to do that, you have to know what you like and then write that, and then those people will come to you. Um and then you never betray that. The other thing, though, is getting to work with editors, getting to work with um, publishers, getting to have, have this experience of being told, okay, well, yeah, you screwed up here, you know, and not getting dicky about it and saying, yeah, uh, okay, yes, I did screw up there. I see why I screwed up. How could, how, do you have any idea how to fix this? Yeah, being easy to work with, being oh, somebody boy. who understands that the editors know what they're talking about and that listening to them might help. Now, I, occasionally you get a dick editor like Holly has in the past, but for the majority of the time, these are the people who you want to publish your stuff. I would definitely say, maybe listen to them. Yeah, the majority of my editors were awesome. Yeah. I mean, truly. And, and they knew their shit. They knew how to see a story, how to understand where it worked, and how to understand where it fell apart. And at the point where you at the, are at the level where they're willing to talk to you, you can learn a lot from these people, and you should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then after the pros, here are the cons. Um, there's no money. These markets are still hard to hit because they are genuine publications and people are reading them and writers who want to be read understand that people are reading them and that they can find their readers this way and you now understand that too. So you are going to be adding to the, the influx of people who understand why these markets are important and who are sending your carefully targeted stories to the right markets. Um, and along with all of the people who are sending all the wrong stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's like those goes, those are the people that are throwing the pasta at the wall and just trying to see what sticks. Yeah. Hopefully, for people like that, nothing will stick. <laughs> right. Now, this, you have to understand, these are going to be small readership. You are not going to find thousands of people from this. You know, you are, you are not even probably going to find hundreds of people, but you might find tens of people. But... but that's your start, man. That's These are the people who will stick with you. These are the people who genuinely love the kind of fiction that you are writing in this small publication that is specifically targeted to them and what they love. And you are going to find some really great longtime fans from this yeah, ten, market. Ten loyal readers yeah. is worth more than... A thousand readers who will open a magazine and be like, "Oh, I remember this. This writer wrote another story. Well, I think I think I recognize the name, yeah. and you know, it's maybe it, and yeah, yeah. That seems like an obvious statement, but again, you have to consider that when you're looking at these markets, right? Right. These smaller markets can give you true fans. Okay, but there there are few. Okay, and again. Watch rights claimed because when you're working with with new publishers, with private indie publishers, with markets that are not professionally, you know, they're not pro markets, you have to be very, very careful to understand what rights they are claiming and not to submit any place where they claim all rights. 
You just don't ever do that. Not ever for any reason, ever, 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 never. And <laughs> as a as another little note here, just from my own personal experience and, and the people that I know that have been submitted and lost a lot of money, and mm -hmm. y you have to look at every publisher, on every online publisher, mm -hmm. with a a magnifying glass look at the other authors that they are listening listing as their their published published authors look them up look up their blogs read about them send them an email hey do these people pay on time because Alora's k for instance was one of those things where they were publishing mm -hmm. people and then they weren't paying them and there was this huge 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 issue with Alora's cave and and anything can go wrong and you know any yeah. company can have an owner that suddenly starts to embezzle or has been embezzling and then the company falls but you want to do your due diligence as a writer first and make sure yeah okay this company pays mm -hmm. why do you think I went immediately for Harlequin uh, other than the fact that it was what I read when I was younger they do they are doing online publications but they have a lot of credibility right once I start submitting to smaller markets or smaller names that's something that i'm going to do is is just a little enough research to know okay these people are actually paying their writers the writers are not complaining about mm -hmm. you know subscribe to the magazine yeah you know yeah if subscribe to the mag it, well that's a big thing anyway is right. a lot of them tell you if you don't read our stuff don't submit right please. because you're not going to know what we want because we are yeah. specific and you can't just read one magazine. Mm -mm. It's it's like I subscribe to Rattle, the poetry thing. I've I've had it since I was in my twenties. It it's like it's this big big book that comes out with a whole bunch of poetry, and nowadays it comes with a chat book from an author. And they tend to one one book will be all about nurse poetry, or one book will all will be all about sexually abused um, victims as children poetry. Mm -hmm. One book will be firefighter poetry. So if you if you just pick up one and you read it and you're like, oh, okay, I can submit to this, and you submit it, well, no, that submission range is already over. They're already looking for something else. Plus, you don't know the kind of poetry that they like mm -hmm. by one book. Right. So you really have to submit or, or subscribe to these zines or magazines read a few issues read some back issues put your work into it okay and the other thing i was thinking of while you were talking about there is getting paid to publish now there is legitimate paying to publish where you are indie publishing where you are doing all the work yourself and where you are paying either to have the books formatted but you own all the rights and you are or you are paying not getting paid to publish you're saying paying paying to paying to publish there are yes there are that bottom feeders that, out there yes okay there are bottom feeders out there who are demanding that they, they will publish absolutely anything you send them they have no standards they have no marketing they have no reach but they will put together a number of books for you without any editing whatsoever with that but they will f charge you thousands of dollars to do this and you will end up there th with books that you cannot sell with books that are not professionally put together with books that have not been edited with books that you are stuck with and you will end up thousands of dollars in the hole and there are magazines that will publish poetry and all you have to do is buy the 257 dollar yep. um whatever you know and they will publish your, your your poem yeah the lower end of that is a lot of times the books are quote 50 dollars mm -hmm. and you submit these little poems to whatever it is and they're like oh hey congratulations your poetry was wonderful and we've added it to our collection if you if you want you can find the book here and then it's like fifty dollars for the book and this is the collection right and people fall for that crap all the time it is a scam yes. it is it is a scam the only people who will ever read that poem are is is per book the one person who wrote it because yeah. the only people who are buying it are the people who are published in it. That's yeah, who wanted to see their name in print. And it, it is just awful. It's that, sad. That, yeah, that these horrible freaking people take uh, um, advantage of people who want to share their work. Yeah. Yeah. That's... So, yeah, definitely, definitely look <clears throat> up into these 
these markets or look into these things and and try to find because the same thing is in the art world there's lots of places where they're like oh your work is wonderful we would love to feature it and Mm -hmm. blah 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 and here pay this much right just don't don't ever pay to publish when it comes to things like that indie publishing is completely different right now there is one site i know of that is legit that works with indie publishers and it is booklocker.com where they are putting together print books they have a a a distribution program that goes to places like amazon and they they do a very nice hardcover book i i bought one when i was looking at them the the quality on it was excellent the printing the cover was was good it was well done and they are legit and yeah you have to pay them to do the book setup for yeah. the print publication but you are not paying them a fortune you are paying them what it costs to set the book up and you are not buying your own copies they have on, an on-site website where the copies sell then they again distribute and yeah it, and that just a little bit of research will show that yeah just i mean they have they have credibility as well right so that's that's the thing is as long as you're looking these things up and making sure that they're correct yeah and and again this is where our community comes in very handy exactly. holly's writing uh it's i'm just gonna give that little plug free account you get the free the free courses and stuff but the community is invaluable it really is to be able to say hey i just got this email is this legit Mm -hmm. and then people can tell you people that have been in this this world longer than you can be like no or yes and it's it's important that you be able to to have people that have your back you know it's it's important to have people that care about other writers not being taken advantage of. Yeah, and that is an important part of being part of a writing community is that it is impossible to know everything that's out there. It is impossible to be on top of every single scam or to be on top of every single good market that's just small um, yeah. or just hard to find. Yeah, because other people can read your stuff and they'll be like, man, you should really submit to so, such and such. And you go, huh? And you might have never even heard of them, yeah. And then yeah. you can check them out. And, and again, the writing community is, like I said, it's invaluable. It is it is just, seriously, it's gold. We have the best people. Be, the yeah. best people. I love my people. They are so cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just seriously, a little plug for the people <laughs> on the community. Yeah, we really do have amazing people on there. Yeah. Um. So, okay, is that everything? Um, well, yeah, you know, that's no money, still hard to hit, and a small readership. Um, and watch watch very carefully on the ones that pay in copies or that don't pay. Uh, okay, now, so now we're now we are down to no payment whatsoever. Okay? And it's very easy to think, well, obviously nobody's going to submit to them, but there are legitimately good reasons to do so. And this, this I figured out the hard way when I was getting started is I sent my stuff out to all the big markets and I heard, you know, nothing back, form rejection, form rejection, form rejection, small markets, form rejection, form rejection, form rejection, little tiny pays and copies markets, form rejection, form rejection, form rejection. No payment markets, all of a sudden I heard back from editors in writing. <laughs> you know, this is not too bad, but, but, and then they would tell me what I'd done wrong. And I learned so much from those markets, from, from the, you know, no, you're, because they are a super targeted super dedicated potentially dedicated but super targeted audience they are stuff like um vampires who drink coffee you know who drink a specific brand of coffee yes you know they are they are these just little works of love put together by people who cannot afford to pay anything and who you know you already know that your stories are going to not get in front of a lot of people you already know this going in but if you understand the market, if you have read 
some of the stuff that has been published by them and you know what they're looking for and it's what you love, you can at least get some good feedback on what you're doing wrong. That the reason that you have gotten form rejections from every frickin' buddy else. And, you know, then, then you can, again, you have this possible chance to find a few readers who will genuinely like what you like, who will email you and say, hey, you know, are you doing anything else? I would love to read more about this character. Um, I would really, you know, what about, what about that character that you just kind of mentioned back there? And, and I kind of thought he was really hot. And <laughs> why don't you do something with that character? <laughs> and you, you find people, not a lot, but you find people who really like something about what you're doing and as you get better because you're emailing them back and forth and you're saying hey he, 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 he. uh would you mind maybe um you know reading the first draft of this for me and telling me where i've messed up because you know your your early readers before i send it off to the editor your early readers will read stuff for you you know yeah and and you can you can build this little tiny community of people who like what you do that as you get better will follow you because you know better <laughs> they genuinely don't object to being to reading stuff that's better well yeah and plus i mean they have they have a certain amount of investment in you in their own mind right. is that you know i've i've been with this writer since i saw this story and they respect me and they respect my opinion. Uh -huh. And I mean, that's that's building a, a very good relationship. Yeah, and I have a few readers that have been writing back and forth with me from time to time for, oh God, decades. These were my first people. And those first people matter. Those first people, you know, they're the ones who will say, you know, I really didn't like that. You did this stuff in there that you know, it was just not for me. And you, you'd you look at it and you say, okay, well, was I true to myself there? Because if I was, I might need to put this into a separate subgenre. Warn these people, this is not your kind of thing. This is something else that I want to write. But sometimes it's, well, I wasn't really true to myself there. Yeah. I, I went away from things that are my core values in my writing to do something experimental and it didn't really work out that well. Um, and it's important to know that. It is important to have people who love what you do who are willing to say, well, you know, that one was not my favorite thing, and here's why. And it's important to have that long relationship of trust where you, you can take this criticism from them because you know genuinely that they love your work and you felt wrong to them in this particular thing. Sometimes you just have an off book. Sometimes your life is, is in, in a bad place and bad stuff happens to your writing at the same time. And I've been there too. And my guys were very forgiving about that. <laughs> so what else is there for when it comes to the free? Well, you have a better chance of editor feedback. You we have- that. Yeah, but you also, have, you, again, you have the bio line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have that thing that's going to go into this publication. It's going to stay there that says this is how to contact this person. Because the, the most important thing you can do when you are getting started and as you continue is to build up the audience of people who genuinely love what you do because you have this bond. And that, that is what a no payment market can get you early, early yeah. when you, when you still kind of suck. <laughs> it can People and credibility. Yeah. 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 And feedback to help you learn how to get better. Yeah. So is that everything up into the takeaway? That is. Okay. So I just want to remind you guys how to follow us. We are on the socials. It is at AIA. R W I P on Twitter. It is Alone with Invisible People on Instagram. It is also Holly dot L I S L E. That's her personal account on Instagram. Mine is R Gallardo. 
Um, we don't really use Twitter that much. We're alone in a room with invisible people on Facebook. You can go to alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. We are now accepting submissions for the Halloween 2019 episode. You can go to that site. We'll have it all over the socials. We'll have it in the email. We'll have it on the website. It, go back to the 2018 Halloween episode and you know, listen, it's, it's me, Holly and Mark, and we are all doing reading aloud your story. That is just our way of thanking you guys for listening to us and giving you a, a, a way to get a story out there. So if you're interested in submitting, uh, go to our site. We'll have all the information up there. We'll have all of the requirements. Um, and if you haven't taken the how to write flash fiction that does not suck course, and you want to submit to this, please take How to Write Flash Fiction That Does Not Suck. It is a free three-week course. You have plenty of time. So let's get to the takeaway. Okay, so the takeaway here. Uh, I have four things for you. First, only submit to markets that fit your genre, which means you are going to have to do some research. If you're in the community, there are people who we help, will help you do that. Two, if you get feedback listen, you're close because editors almost always, they have, they have like the, the rejection form on speed dial where the, you know, first line, first page sucks, bam, rejected. And they can, they can go through the bad stuff really, really fast. So if you get something personal back to, to understand that this is almost a miracle, almost okay it means you're close it means if you make the changes or if you fix the problem in your next story when you submit back to this market the second time you might sell something so listen when you get feedback it's not somebody trying to be mean it's somebody trying to help you third submit from top tier to bottom tier but don't quit so you go, you go from the best paying market first, you know, that fits, that fits, not all best paying markets, the best paying markets that fit your genre through the semi pros, through the pays and copies to the no payments, making sure that you always watch the rights claimed, making sure that you are, are very careful that these are legitimate markets and that you check this out with other people before you submit, but always top tier down to no payment in that order. And then the last thing in the takeaway is you keep writing new stories while subbing existing ones. And the obvious example for that is that it's been over a year that Becky has had a perfectly publishable, really good novel out with a publisher. And at this point, she's kind of, you know, it's entertainment value to see how long it takes them to get back to her one way or the other. Um, and while you are entertaining yourself with how long this shit takes, you want to be continuing to get, do new work, to get things out there, to maintain a steady record of submission and making things, making your career the thing that you can do. So with that, Becky and I are going to say our goodbyes. Yeah. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. We really love you guys. If you want to really be a part of the communications and the, and the community and everything, just drop in hollyswritingclasses.com, free account, and join and, and talk to everybody and get to know people. It's the best way to be in communication with other writers, and it's just, it's a fantastic group. They're always, you know, it's just a lot of fun. So we love you guys. Thank you guys for listening. And Holly? Yes. Um, the, but the one thing I want to just, just say on the way out the door here is there are bad markets. They are the, the crooks and the shills and the, the people who are trying to rip off uh, people who don't know better. You yeah. need to not be one of those people. The small pay in, co pay in copies or no payment whatsoever markets are not bad markets. If you are getting started, they are great markets. They are peop they are creations done as labors of love, and you will be the recipient of some of that love. So go guys.
I wondered, okay, I thought Tony was like like doing obscene things over in the corner no, or something no tony's tony's at work but i wouldn't put him past it <laughs> he, he usually is very very respectful of podcast time okay but, okay oh thank but, god oh thank god he took a hint and now he's just doing his regal lion pose this but is... yeah it was he was up there and he was gonna pounce on me and it, i could just oh, see no. everything just bam oh, god ollie and devil pose huh yeah and it's the best way to be incommunicado with <laughs> Us and other writers, and not, we, we just can't... Not you know? incommunicado. That means having no communication. Oh, Lord. 